Welcome to the afternoon session of Kakadu Evolves, uh, then and now Confidence, Cooperation and Capable. We have a, uh, a great session this afternoon that builds on uh, two really fulsome ones this morning, where we had the pleasure of uh, listening to both academic perspectives, uh, the Australian Navy perspective, as well as uh, the perspectives of uh, partners in the Pacific and in Southeast Asia. Uh, we intend on building on that today. For those present this morning, uh, you'll notice the size of the panel is uh, substantially larger. It's continued to grow. Uh, so it's going to be a great afternoon uh, to really bring it home. It gives me uh, some, a great pleasure to uh, introduce the chair uh, this afternoon, uh, Richard, Dr. Richard Dunley. He's uh, the lecturer of uh, School of Humanities and Social Scienti Sciences at the University of New South Wales in Canberra, where he teaches naval history to trainee officers at the Australian Defence Force Academy. And his research interests include British naval and strategic policy. Uh, British diplomatic history and the development of military technology, archives and record keeping. So uh, with that, uh, Doctor, I invite you to make some opening remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, is this working? Yes, it is. Good. Um, I just firstly wanted to talk a little bit about um, what we've heard already, because I know the audience in these uh, panels changes quite quickly. Um, and so I think we've had a really fascinating look at the history of Kakadu, um, which is something that I perhaps should know more about than, than I, I did, and I've learnt quite a bit um, hearing from not only the Australian perspective, but perspectives um, from, from other participants. And hopefully we will hear a little bit more of that um, uh, over the next uh, sort of hour or so. Um, one of, I think, the things, the themes which really came through was the fact that the exercise over this period of time, starting in, in, in 1993 and the original ideas in 1991, the exercise has changed considerably. Um, and now looking forward, the world in which we're operating, this Indo-Pacific world, is also changing. Um, and so there are some questions uh, and thoughts which perhaps we can, we can tease out about what role this exercise and exercises more generally play um, and should play in the, the Indo-Pacific going forward. Um, thinking about this in terms of, of the framing of the conference more broadly, uh, Cooperative and collaborative regional partnerships. It's one of the key themes that's, that's being brought out. So how can naval exercises, how can uh, Kakadu uh, sort of support this endeavor? Um, and perhaps how can it do it better than it has been so far? Um, and then there are other themes which I guess we, we need to think about. Um, one of which is that, as I've suggested, uh, the Indo-Pacific is changing quite rapidly. Um, and the context in which navies are operating is, is changing rapidly. Notably, there's been quite a, a shift in focus over the past, I suppose, 10 years, maybe, um, from perhaps the softer end of maritime tasks to uh, the, the more sort of high-end conflict-type uh, operations. Um, so how do naval exercises, uh, and Kakadu in particular, fit into that shift? Is there a requirement to shift going forward, um, or, or perhaps not? Other questions which have been thrown out um, by some of our earlier panellists and which perhaps we can con sort of consider, um, who should be involved? Uh, the inclusion of uh, the United States is something that, that uh, has been already mentioned. Um, I think it was 2016. Um, and, of course, the, the inclusion of, of, of China as well. Um, does that change the nature of an exercise like Kakadu? Um, should other governmental and non-governmental agencies be involved? Uh, is that a, an appropriate way to, to develop this exercise? Um, I think I'm going to leave it there as, as just some thoughts which have come out from the earlier discussion and which perhaps we can then think about and, and engage on uh, with uh, an extraordinary panel of, of, of speakers that we've got here who can bring a whole range of different perspectives uh, to this topic. Thanks, Doctor. Um, so now it's a pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this afternoon, Dr Beck Stratting is well known uh, in the strategic conversations around Australia. She's the Director of La Trobe Asia and the La Trobe University and Associate Professor in Politics and International Relations in the Department of Politics, Media and Philosophy. Her research has focused on maritime disputes in Asia and Australian foreign and defence policy. In 2019, she was awarded 
the visiting fellowship to research at the East West Centre in Washington DC. She has also been a visiting affiliate fellow at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore, a researcher at Georgetown University and is currently a non-visiting fellow at the Perth USA Asia Centre. She was awarded the prestigious Boyer Prize by the Australian Institute of International Affairs for the best article published in the Australian Journal of Inter International Affairs in 2017 for her paper on Timor-Leste's foreign policy approach to the Timor Sea. She's written over 70 commentary pieces for organisations such as Lowy, ASPE, East Asia Forum, the New Mandela, Asia Global Online and the Australian Outlook. So we look forward to your presentation this afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be here and I would like to uh, thank the Sea Power uh, Centre for inviting me uh, to uh, this conference. I, I attended in 2019 and I had a fantastic time and I learnt a lot and I can already tell that I'm learning a lot uh, from uh, the conference this year. I would also like to acknowledge the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, uh, the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet and recognise their ongoing cultural connection, not just to the land, uh, but to the water uh, surrounding that land. So I've been asked to address the question of how we can make sense of exercises such as Exercise Kakadu within the broader regional security architecture, uh, including thinking about uh, the new shift towards uh, mini-laterals. Now, I did what academics often do, which is uh, take possibly the least interesting part of that question and seek to define it. So I'm going to be talking about this concept of regional architecture because it is a term uh, that does get used a lot but it's not always unpacked and it's not always explained very well. Uh, so while this morning uh, there's been a lot of focus on Exercise Kakadu itself and on specifics such as naval diplomacy, I've really been asked to zoom out and consider uh, the broader regional security context and to think about how uh, we can contextualise the exercises uh, and how they might help us to, um, or how they might contribute to uh, our strategic aims. Now, the 2020 Defence Strategic Update, as we all know, has three uh, key aims. We want to shape Australia's strategic environment, we want to deter actions against Australia's interests, and we want to respond with credible force if necessary. Uh, and we've heard earlier about how we might be able to connect interoperability and cooperation uh, with deterring revisionist states in the region. But what I would like to focus on is this first aim of how Australia can shape its strategic environment. So I'm going to begin with the idea of how we can shape our regional security architecture and what that actually means. Uh, and then I'm going to move on to talk about maritime security architecture, because that is a related but different concept that also gets used and has its own specific meanings. Uh, and then I want to consider uh, the concept of, of defence diplomacy and how this relates to uh, what we're um, beginning to call new strategic minilateralism and the maritime security architecture. So first, regional security architecture. In 2010, Bill Toe and Brendan Taylor described security architecture as an overarching, coherent and comprehensive security structure for a geographically defined area which facilitates the resolution of that region's policy concerns and achieves its security objectives. Now, they were talking about Asia's security architecture. Now, 12 years later, we're much more likely to be talking about Indo-Pacific security architecture. But the terminology should not be used just for mere synonym, synonym for a multilateral security institution. Rather, it's this overarching structure that incorporates institutions. It incorporates patterns of interactions from bilateral relationships to minilateral relationships to multilateral relationships. So what then does the Indo-Pacific security architecture look like? Well, I would argue that there's probably three 
contested security architectures. There isn't just one security architecture that we might talk about. The first is the ASEAN-centred model. So you have uh, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, but then you have uh, all of these associated institutions and forums uh, that spring from that particular regional ecosystem. One that I think is particularly important is the ASEAN Regional Forum, which brings together those Southeast Asian states, but in a dialogue with other regional states, such as Australia, China, Japan, and importantly, India. So the ASEAN-centred model is one that is particularly important for Southeast Asian states, and Australia makes a, an effort, particularly in its uh, strategic narratives, to emphasise ASEAN centrality. It doesn't want to compete with ASEAN this kind of architecture. It would like this kind of architecture to be incorporated within what Australia and its partners are also doing in the region. But the second model uh, of, of Indo-Pacific security architecture, we could argue, exists is the China model. This is perhaps focused less on formal institutions, but has developed through the Belt and Road Initiative. And I would argue that this is an approach to regional security archi architecture that's really uh, based on geoeconomics, so that combining of security and economics in order to achieve strategic and political objectives. This is a, a, a model of regional security architecture that I think Australia and its partners in the regions are trying to compete with. And that is through the third model, which is the Indo-Pacific security architecture that's anchored uh, or that has a, a, a focus on keeping the US uh, anchored in the region. So as I said before, there are some overlaps with the ASEAN-centred model, uh, but it's more in competition with the China uh, model uh, of, of uh, security architecture in our region. So as To and Teller tell us, security architecture tends to be shorthand for a preferred vision of order. Uh, and often when we talk about, uh, when we're in Australia or, or the United States and we're talking about security architecture, really what we're talking about is the architecture that we want to promote. Uh, and, and that is, I think, uh, this, this Indo-Pacific architecture that really tries to embed US presence in the region and also seeks to counter or deter uh, revisionist intentions uh, but also to try and shape the strategic environment. So I think this Indo-Pacific security architecture is involving in three key ways. First, the US alliance structure is changing. So the so-called hub and spoke system, where you know you had the US as the hub and you had various spokes, the the allies in the region. Uh, this is the you know the basis of US order for a long time in the region in the 20th century. But that's now uh, expanding to include other partners such as India. And there's a more networked approach to how these states uh, that are allies of the United States are, are relating. So the Biden administration, for example, appears to be emphasising an interrelated web of alliances and partnerships uh, through this concept of integrated deterrence. Now, possibly what integrated deterrence looks like in practice is a bit unclear at the moment, but it might be defined broadly as building collective capacity to deter and counter aggression and to try to shape the regional security environment or in the words of US Secretary of Defence Lloyd Austin, it's about using every military and non-military tool in our toolbox in lockstep with our allies and partners. And as I'll get to a little bit later, I think exercises like Exercise Kakadu fit in with that idea of integrated deterrence or more broadly, using that collective capacity to try to shape uh, the regional environment. So that's the first shift uh, in terms of the Indo-Pacific, the emerging Indo-Pacific security architecture. 
The second is that unlike the China-led security architecture, the economic and the security dimensions of this new or emerging architecture appear to be increasingly separated. For example, there are two central regional trading instruments, RCEP and the CPTPP, and these do not contain India. And the US withdrew uh, from the TPP and doesn't really look like returning. So the US doesn't really have an economic Indo-Pacific strategy as yet. This is pretty clear actually in the Indo-Pacific strategy document that was released. And this creates some problems when your key competitor is doing, secure, is, is doing strategy and economics kind of simultaneously. So in our region, developing states have historically prioritised nation building through economic development and where domestic political legitimacy in, in a lot of those countries is built on delivering economic goods, this seems to be a bit of a gap uh, in the Indo-Pacific security architecture. Perhaps less interesting for exercise Kakadu, but an important point I think to make nevertheless. And finally, the, the third key area I think uh, that's shifting is uh, this idea of new strategic minilateralism. So this focus on uh, or the, the, the emphasis and the prioritisation of new forms of minilateralism. Now, minilateralism is not new, but the new forms of minilateralism might be said to, uh, to, be, to look a little bit differently. And we, we see minilateralism as occupying this space between bilateralism and multilateralism, but there are contested definitions about what it is. Are they informal? Do they have formal memberships? To what extent are they institutionalised or ad hoc? Do they focus on one issue? Do they focus on a range of issues? Uh, and there's a really important piece here about inclusivity. Who gets included in these minilaterals that are attempting to shape the regional security order? Can we think of Exercise Kakadu, in a sense, as being a part of this new strategic uh, minilateralism? So the, the new strategic minilateralism is exemplified by the Quad, uh, by AUKUS, and they're, expand, they're more expansive in their focus, they're more institutionalised and likely to be grappling with a range of security-focused issues uh, than the minilaterals of the past. So there's lots of reasons why this new form of strategic minilateralism has emerged. And I don't have time to talk about them all, but there's some key ones. The rise of China, obviously, is one driving factor and an effort uh, by member states to shape a favourable balance of power. Uh, but there's also new strategic minilateralism is a response to uh, capability gaps in the existing or, or the, 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 the pre-existing US-centred networked security architecture. So there are concerns that US primacy is not something that exists anymore. And so minilateralism is part of that trying to grapple with this new contested security order where you have a, a credible uh, competitor trying to promote its own vision of a regional security order. Uh, they're also dealing with complex emerging security challenges, particularly in the maritime security domain. And perhaps really importantly, minilateralism is filling a gap that's being created by international bureaucracies that are unwieldy, that are burdensome, that are slow, that are inefficient. We can think of the sort of the big um, multilateral institutions that are seen uh, as being inflexible, whereas minilateralism uh, can provide uh, more flexibility that can be focused on specific issues and they can be focused on providing goods to the region. So that's a kind of broad overview of regional security architecture, but how does that fit in with maritime security architecture? Because if we want to understand the Indo-Pacific as a region, we have to get beyond conventional ideas of regional security architecture, and we need to map the diverse patterns of engagement that may be formal, they may be ad hoc, they may be issue-based, they may be flexible, they may be informal, but they also incorporate routinised exercises and defence diplomacy activities uh, such as Exercise Kakadu and also 
such as Indo-Pacific Endeavour, uh, which, uh, you know, there's been some, some talk, I think, that that's going to occur again uh, this year. And I was on the Indo-Pacific uh, Endeavour as an academic sea rider back in 2019. Uh, and to me, as an academic, it was a really fascinating um, view uh, into uh, naval diplomacy and public diplomacy. And I know Justin was talking about that uh, in the session earlier. But going back to the key point, maritime security architectures are a bit different. They are maritime centric. They focus on integrated, multifaceted and complex maritime security challenges that aren't just state based. They view the seas as a common security space, or as Peter Dean said today, an operating environment. They focus on maritime security cooperation. They may have a, a transnational flavour. They may include non-state actors. They may include corporate actors. They may include you know, members of the shipping industry. Recognising uh, that many of the key maritime security challenges are not just conventional, they're a blend of conventional and emerging. They may encompass military uh, and, uh, military and issues around conflict, but they're also about pandemics, they're also about climate change, they're also about sustainability, they're also about the blue economy. Uh, so within this, there is um, maritime security architectures that may transcend uh, the regional security architecture, they might include actors that aren't a part of that regional security architecture, and it really highlights the complexity of contemporary maritime security issues. So there is a sense in which in the maritime security architecture space, this is, much like the world's oceans, an increasingly crowded space. So there's more institutions. Uh, there might be confusion about who does what. There might be competing mandates about these institutions or these exercises and what they do. There's a risk of duplication. There's a risk of inefficiency. And there's a risk of overlap. And with mini laterals, there are also questions, there are risks around inclusivity of geography. Who's included? Who isn't included? Some analysts are concerned that Indo-Pacific minilaterals, such as the Quad and AUKUS, are really only platforms for regional powers to extend their influence. And why we might necessarily, we might not necessarily see it like that, uh, that is a view that needs to be um, respected. And although there is often a talk about regional inclusion in the language of these minilaterals, such as ASEAN centrality, through their membership and through their actions, these states uh, are supporting their own view of what a favourable balance of power looks like. And this may not, in fact, be shared across all regional states in this vast area that we call the Indo-Pacific. So I'm going to wrap up, but I did want to talk about Exercise Kakadu because I know I was going to zoom out, but now I need to bring it back in. And Peter asked today, where does it get us strategically, exercises like this? How does it help us meet our strategic objectives? And as Justin mentioned, that is a really difficult thing to measure. It's much like influence and persuasion. How do we measure that? It's much easier for us to know when we don't have it than when we do have it. But these exercises, are, are, in my view, are important because they're inclusive. They're more inclusive than the Quad or AUKUS. They allow Australia to engage with regional partners uh, and I see this as part of the, the maritime security architecture of the Indo-Pacific, providing training opportunities uh, for maritime security and surveillance, assisting states in protecting uh, their own maritime sovereign rights, improving maritime operability with regional states beyond just the, our traditional allies and partners. Uh, the the ca capacities of, of military groups, of systems and equipment to connect and to cooperate, to effectively share data with each other in coordinated ways is an incredibly part of these, uh, important part uh, of these exercises, including in prioritising and providing benefits to smaller navies in the region. This, I think, is what's going to help us to build our influence. This is what's going to help us 
to, um, to shape that security environment. And at a time of strategic competition, Australia's capacity to influence and to persuade, of course, requires more than hard power components. It requires the hard and the soft power components to be working together effectively, holistically, uh, within uh, these, this evolving security architecture. Uh, nowhere is this more apparent than the Solomon Islands China Pact, where Australia's relations with smaller and middle powers across the Indo-Pacific obviously has an impact on our own strategic interests and how we're able to achieve our goals, such as shaping uh, the region. So I'm going to leave it there, but I would just like to say that exercise Kakadu as part of this maritime security architecture, really from what I got from the presentations uh, earlier today was the personnel to personnel relationships, the strategic narratives are, are very important. There's the interoperability, of course, the ability of navies to work together. But there's another piece here about Australia wanting to defend its own version of a maritime rules-based order that's rooted in international law of the sea. And I think this is part of what those exercises allow too. Uh, and this is a rules-based order that, benefit, be, that benefits Australia's interests uh, and our priorities. And so these exercises can also be seen uh, as a way of Australia trying to shape the normative environment uh, as well as being able to engage uh, in hard power uh, military Military capabilities. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Doctor, for uh, putting that back. You certainly lifted the strategic uh, framework. For those who are watching or listening to the uh, session just before lunch, that was the keynotes. Uh, I think the thrust was we really need to lift the strategic messaging and understand that there is a real big uh, political vision in here as well which I think has a perfect segue into our next uh, presenter, uh, Professor uh, Paul Madison, uh, who comes to us with some unique uh, background, which I think I'm really looking forward to, to listening to. So uh, uh, Professor Madison is also known by uh, Vice Admiral uh, Madison Retired. He served the Canadian Armed Forces for 38 years and retired as their Chief of, Chief of Navy. Uh, and now he's uh, been able to build on a, on a a military career and uh, came to Australia and served as the High, Commission, High Commissioner to uh, Australia from Canada. So from a uh, unique blend of being able to bring a military service and the diplomatic service together. So we're really looking forward to hearing some of your insights this afternoon. Well, thank you, Admiral, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me start by thanking the Sea Power Centre for the invitation to be here with you today. Um, and also to acknowledge um, the Gadigal people, to pay my respects uh, to their uh, elders, uh, past and present. Um, look, it's, it's, it's great for me to be able to, to be here and talk about the Canadian Navy. I don't get to do that a lot here in Australia. I've been here now for almost seven years. Um, uh, and so I, I, I'm going to share um, Canada's sort of Kakadu experience with you. Um, what I'm doing now, though, just... Um, just just for your, your information, is um, I work at the University of New South Wales, and I've spent the last, um, since I um, completed my post as the High Commissioner, and not only was I High Commissioner to Australia, but I was High Commissioner and Ambassador to seven Melanesian and Micronesian nations. So I had, I had the great privilege of being out in Vanuatu and Solomon Islands, or Papua New Guinea, Nauru, Palau, Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands, and spending time with leaders there and understanding, um, and trying to understand, uh, some of the significant strategic issues um, that they are facing, uh, which, of course, are very much in Australia's uh, strategic interest. Um, now, to come and speak about the Royal Canadian Navy in, in Kakadu, I reached back to my colleagues in Canada, obviously, um, uh, read a couple of the post-deployment reports, and uh, so we had, we've participated in Kakadu twice. Uh, in 2016, uh, HMCS Vancouver, a, a frigate, um, participated. Um, in 2018, HMCS Calgary, as well as a, um, a replenishment ship that we had taken up from trade and converted, the Asterix, um, participated. And when I read the post-deployment reports, or at least the unclassified excerpts that were sent to me, um, my initial takeaway was if I was a ship's captain or a bridge watchkeeper, 
Um, I would have really wanted to be in that exercise. So obviously the Royal Australian Navy put a great deal of effort into bringing partners together, generating some very um, useful um, and, and sort of sequentially um, more advanced uh, warfighting scenarios that from a, a naval warfare readiness perspective really challenged the ship's companies. And, and they came away from that, uh, especially during a long deployment where sustaining combat readiness at a high level it can be a challenge as you go from port visit to port visit. Um, Kakadu really met the mark. Um, let me talk briefly about the Royal Canadian Navy for those of you who aren't too familiar with it. Uh, the order of battle at the moment is 12 uh, frigates. Um, those frigates were um, uh, mid-lifed uh, about 10 years ago, a four and a half billion dollar project. Those ships will, will they, they are the workhorses of the fleet and they will continue to deploy globally uh, combat ready for years to come. Um, the destroyers uh, that we had as task group, uh, anti-air uh, shooters, long-range long shooters, were paid off uh, over about five, six years ago. Uh, and those capabilities will be uh, re re regenerated in, in the next class of ship, which is a, uh, like, like the Hunter, a BAE Type 26 variant um, with some interesting differences in, in the design. But... Um, when those ships come out, they will replace the frigates. Uh, four submarines, which are uh, conventional, powered, um, old, uh, requiring replacement. Um, and they're just talking now, beginning to talk about a next generation submarine in Canada. So um, we, we, Canada will probably face another submarine uh, capability gap um, sometime in the late 2030s, early 2040s. Um, the at-sea replenishment capability uh, was paid off uh, a few years ago. There are AORs under construction now to replace them, but in the interim, a innovative um, uh, commercial uh, uh, modified uh, vessel was, was generated and it actually deployed with Calgary over here in 2018. Um, there's a number of Arctic offshore patrol ships that have recently been built and they're op operating up in the high Arctic. And, um, we could talk later about the Arctic if you wish, but clearly there's a great focus in Canada and in the U.S. Um, and amongst uh, other allies around what is happening, what potentially will happen in the Arctic, what the Chinese are doing, what the Russians are doing, and what climate change is doing, and, and why that is, is generating a, a much greater demand signal for um, naval uh, persistent uh, high Arctic uh, patrol presence. Um, but here to the Indo-Pacific. Um, a little bit of history uh, about Canada in, in, in the Pacific. Um, it actually began before Canada was a nation. So the Royal Navy established uh, the Pacific Station on the south coast of Vancouver Island in the late 1840s uh, to complement the Australia and the China stations. They built uh, a base. For those of you who have visited uh, Esquimalt, the home of the West Coast Fleet in Canada, you've seen some old kind of looking buildings. Um, those were built by the Brits um, back then. Uh, they sustained that station uh, as Canada came into being in 1867. And when the Royal Canadian Navy came into being in 1910, that base was transferred to, uh, to Canada. Uh, the government then um, took responsibility for its maritime security. Um, through, when we get to the Second World War, um, uh, certainly there was an uh, investment in and a concern around uh, Northeast Pacific security as the, as the Imperial Japanese threat uh, manifested itself in the 30s. Um, but the focus was clearly on uh, what was happening in Europe. And so the Royal Canadian Navy uh, really came of age in the Battle of the North Atlantic, which arguably was the most important strategic campaign of the war, um, the longest, and it, one in which Canada, alongside the uh, Royal Navy, the United States Navy, uh, decisively defeated the Nazi U-boat threat and ensured that Great Britain remained um, supplied, uh, viable, and, and able to prosecute the war in, in Europe. But as soon as the uh, victory in Europe was assured, there was a rapid reorientation of the Navy towards and, and redeployment towards uh, the Pacific campaign, where Australia was obviously deeply committed. Um, we had one destroyer uh, here in uh, mid Early, early 45, and as the others were getting ready to come over, of course, the, the, the war culminated, and that was that. Um, but in 1950, when the Korean conflict broke out, a destroyer battle group, um, or task group, uh, deployed immediately out of uh, that same base in Esquimalt uh, in British Columbia, uh, deployed into the theater, operated in coastal and riverine uh, waters, doing naval gunfire support, 
Uh, we, our army was obviously engaged uh, alongside the diggers there. Um, uh, some great stories about uh, NGS and trains uh, and, and supply, supply lines. Um, and, and then, you know, as, as we get through the Cold War, uh, the Navy um, deployed um, regularly, routinely, um, out of the West Coast base uh, into Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, Oceania-type uh, deployments. And it was really about showing the flag. It was really about um, um, building those uh, kind of uh, relationships and trust that you've, I hear you've been talking about here today. And as I, as I was growing up as a young officer, um, you know, RIMPAC in 1982, uh, you know, I, I, I sailed in, a, in several RIMPACs. And, and Canada has, has generated into every RIMPAC um, in, in, in memory. Um, and, and like Australia, we have... Uh, commanded at the sort of the deputy commander level at the uh, various um, sort of component um, commander uh, levels um, uh, and, and participated in, in, in a number of fourth generation exercises. Um, in 9-11, uh, in uh, after 9-11, we paused and, and, and in, in deploying to this area because the entire order of battle generated three times in, into, the, into the Arabian Gulf in, in the global war on terror. And so ships out of the East Coast, out of the West Coast, were, were all going into the, uh, into the, into the theater uh, in the Arabian Gulf. And those ships that were actually coming across the Pacific uh, were, were simply stopping for gas and, 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 uh, and, and groceries <coughs> and, and, and getting through Malacca as fast as they could in, into theater and then stopping for a port visit or two on the way back. But we lost a lot of that... Um, sort of relationship and partnership based engagement and 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 in Australia it was noted um, and and amongst our other partners especially you know in, in Japan Korea um, you know the Philippines um, Indonesia Singapore Thailand uh, Malaysia Vietnam China um, you know there was a there was a sense that Canada had somehow retreated but it was it was simply due to numbers and priority um, we also, as we went through this fleet to reconstitution, uh, we were limited by numbers. And so um, getting ships back into this part of the world was a bit of a challenge. And when I was commander, uh, I really focused on that. And over the past several years, we've seen annual, again, an annual deployments of Canadian warships, um, Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, when we can into Australia and New Zealand. And when I was high commissioner, it, it gave me the opportunity to... And, uh, while working with the Foreign Service uh, to support the Navy in, in working with our diplomatic corps, in, our headquarters in, in Ottawa, to co-design um, our deployments so in order to um, achieve those Government of Canada strategic objectives. And so, you know, port selection um, and, and countries of engagement selection was done w with a view of getting maximum strategic benefit uh, for, for Canada um, via the Navy. Um, and so the Kakadu obviously was a, an obvious uh, example of that. You know, why Kakadu? Well, obviously, uh, you know, Canada and Australia, uh, we say we're strategic cousins. Um, same values, shared interests. Um, Canada sees itself as a Pacific nation. Um, having lived in Australia now for almost seven years, I know that uh, if Canada really wants to be perceived as a Pacific nation in this part of the world, uh, a, a much greater and persistent and strategic effort will, will need to continue to be applied. Um, but coming and, 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 and sailing alongside um, Australia, sailing alongside um, partners and allies in this part of the world, uh, it, it just makes sense. And um, it's also driven, obviously, by some of the things that Dr. Strading was describing. Um, the Indo-Pacific, you know, I used to say when I gave speeches in Canada that, you know, th th this is the, um, you know, the center of the vortex in terms of the, the design of the 21st century in, in, t in terms of um, a security. And, you know, what we have seen uh, come out of China over the past several years, especially since the uh, 19th Congress in, in 2017, and some of the sort of open de declarations of the Chinese Communist Party about their strategic intent with respect to reshaping um, the rules-based international order that we had assumed uh, would, would be sustained, um, perhaps for perpetuity, um, has obviously caused us to 
to, to reflect and, and to reassess um, the potential threat and, and, and the rate at which that threat may be coming, and, and, and to observe very closely the civil-military fusion in China and the rate at which human capital and, and financial resources and industrial capacity and academic weight has been applied to accelerate uh, the generation of disruptive technology capabilities um, in the PLA uh, to such an extent that the United States has named China uh, uh, as, as a peer adversary with probably uh, competitive advantage capabilities in areas perhaps like hypersonics and, um, and, and quantum technologies. So when you look at all of that, there's a real reason why Canada would come here. It's, it's in Canada's national interest to be here um, alongside uh, a Navy like Australia, which has a very clear uh, and open uh, view to what is happening up north, uh, to understand um, how uh, force generation, force development is being geared to address uh, the potential of having to respond, not just shape and deter, but to respond. Um, and so, in, 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 in talking to uh, Vancouver and Calgary, uh, when, after they deployed in, here in 16 and 18, because um, as High Commissioner, I co-hosted a reception on board Vancouver in Brisbane after Kakadu, and they were telling me that it was an excellent exercise. The crew loved getting ashore. Um, phenomenal uh, sort of host, um, um, uh, hosting by their Australian uh, mates. Um, really enjoyed um, spending time with all of the uh, partner nations, uh, sailors, and it wasn't just you know captains to captains, but it was the petty officers and the more junior sailors getting time together and really developing an understanding of how different navies do different things differently, how they're led differently, different cultures. You know, senior enlisted uh, have different uh, responsibilities, um, uh, you know, and just getting a and, and getting a sense for different capabilities as well. And then getting a feel for, so how, if we were going to get into a fight, how would we do that? Um, you know, would, there's obviously um, uh, some, some navies are more uh, weaponized than others. Some have more sort of persistent blue water capability than others. H how do you sort of manage that um, at the higher end of the spectrum of ops? Uh, and, and so they, um, they, they reported on that. Interestingly, Brisbane, when she left Vancouver, she was on her way. She went down to New Zealand for the, um, the fleet review. I think it was the centennial of the New Zealand Navy. And, of course, the earthquake in Christchurch occurred. So here we had a forward-deployed, high-readiness uh, frigate that immediately was able to, on behalf of all Canadians, respond uh, to, 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 to um, uh, supporting New Zealanders, some of them living the worst days of their lives in the aftermath of that earthquake. And that just speaks to that... Um, that, that, that sort of uh, that collaboration, that, that, that recognition that things happen at sea, things, things happen um, uh, in coastal areas, and, and b being there, we, you know, everybody just comes, you know, you, you come hard to starboard, you come up to 30 knots, and you just go, you launch the helicopter, and, and, and that's um, the kind of um, the, the, the kind of response you can generate when you're there. And that was an important message that we took back uh, to our political leaders in, in Ottawa. Um, in, in, in 2018, uh, I went up and visited Calgary in Darwin. And, and one of the reasons I went is I used to command Cal Calgary. And uh, it was just uh, you know, great to be there. But they, um, they had been uh, assigned a, a commander of a task unit. Um, they were really um, complimentary of the uh, advanced uh, uh, air defense and anti-submarine warfare exercises. That at one point they had six fast air flying multi-axis on them. Um, that was tremendous. Um, they were the only ship that uh, was confident to tow their array in shallow water, um, and they were able to detect and track and and uh, and vector uh, attacks onto subsurface contacts uh, w with the towed array. I mean that was great. And from a Canadian perspective, that sort of showed their their high level of readiness in in, in ASW. They even uh, were given the responsibility of running the photo X, um, which is, has nothing to do with, with warfare, but it's actually a pretty challenging scenario, as you know. So there were 23 ships in the photo X, and, um, and the captain <laughs> told me that it was, 
uh, quite a lot of preparation al alongside and then at sea getting it all together but he was really proud of the fact that everybody went to their assigned station it all worked out well and he showed me the picture and and, and we were proud to have done that so look um, the last thing I'll say is, you know, talking about the sailors ashore, uh, never underestimate how important it is for sailors to have a little fun during a deployment. Um, it, it, it's, it's great for retention. So for Canadian sailors to come to this part of the world, to get ashore, to meet Australians, to, to go ashore in Bangkok, to go ashore in Manila, to go ashore um, in, in, uh, in any uh, Asian country, is a phenomenal cultural experience for young Canadians. And they go back to Canada and they tell all their friends, their friends then suddenly have an interest in joining the Navy. And, and, and so that's, that, that kind of uh, uh, retention and, and recruiting uh, can't be underestimated. So, so uh, I'll, I'll stop there, by, but just close in saying, um, Vice Admiral Craig Baines, who's the current commander of the Navy, he's here at Indo-Pacific 2022, uh, told me yesterday how important Kakadu is, has been, He's hoping to generate ships into Kakadu 2022. Um, it may be a challenge for him, but if, 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 if they don't, they'll certainly be back in 24. Um, and again, he was extremely complimentary on the professionalism, um, the multi-layered sort of readiness um, opportunities generated uh, by the RAN uh, through Kakadu. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Admiral. Uh, it gives me great pleasure now to invite uh, France to be able to speak with, through two uh, speakers. I think uh, we all recognise the fact that France truly is a, uh, a global power uh, with a presence in pretty much most of the ocean space uh, throughout the world. And when you listen to some of their presentations, they'll quite happily point out where they've got small little island uh, presence very close to uh, others. So uh, it gives a great uh, pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Admiral Ray, the Commander of the French Armed Forces in French Polynesia and the Commanding General, Joint Forces Pacific. Uh, as a, good, mo good uh, afternoon, everybody. As a French Joint Commander for the Asia Pacific, I would like to, to share a few views with you um, regarding my, my country in this part of the world, from Malacca to uh, America. Uh, first of all, um, the Indo-Pacific is at the heart of uh, global issues uh, which concern France as an Indo-Pacific nation. We share the necessity to develop a multilateral approach uh, to maintain, uh, if I could call, uh, regional balances of power. That involves promoting effective multilateralism based on the rule of law and the rejection of coercion. Multilateralism, which involves all stakeholders, is the best framework in which to reduce tensions and encourage cooperative approaches rather than operating via blocks. IONS, Indo-Ocean Naval Symposium with a French presidency from 2021 to 2023, or Western Pacific Naval Symposium with uh, uh, QS, which, is, uh, which was a French initiative and uh, today is a, a project of uh, uh, WPNS. Uh, I call about uh, code for uh, unplanned encounter at sea. Uh, these two examples are good means um, in this regard of multilateralism. Many uh, initiatives have been developed on our, and our partnerships with countries in the region have reached unprecedented levels of cooperation in the maritime security domain. But much remains to be done. We already uh, did together Marara exercise, and uh, when I am speaking today, we are conducting this exercise around, uh, in French Polynesia, around Tahiti Island, with 12 countries, uh, which is, an, as you well know, an HADR uh, exercise with multinational command and control. And uh, we uh, 
every year, France uh, conducts this kind of exercise. This year, Mara, next year, Southern Cross in New Caledonia. In these same uh, ideas, we uh, conduct every year, year uh, um, Pacific Coast Guard seminar to develop um, um, common understanding in this uh, aspect of the, our uh, responsibility in the area, HDR and uh, Coast Guard function of protection of our uh, EEZ. Of course, we uh, involve uh, our forces in a big exercise like uh, RIMPAC, CCAP, and uh, COP North exercises. Australia and France are both Indo-Pacific nations with shared interest in a prosperous, resilient, and secure region. So uh, the Kakadu exercises um, have deepened our uh, military interoperability and complemented our regional partnerships in a spirit of mutual benefit. About um, partnership, I would like to mention our Tonga intervention in the framework of the France Agreement or uh, the um, deployment of our frigate um, Vendemiaire this year too, uh, gave us opportunity to cooperate with a few countries in the area, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Republic of Korea, Japan, and the United States. Pitch Black in uh, 2022, uh, with our um, deployment, Pegasus deployment, will be uh, another, will give us uh, other um, possibility to cooperate. I mentioned this exercise, even if it's not in my time domain, it's an important, from France perspective, important uh, occasion to cooperate together. The which to uh, develop coordinated maritime presence, CMP, in um, Indian Ocean, and um, today in the, the Pacific Ocean, uh, could help us to build in that way a better and more efficient um, cooperation. Um, the, the Kakadu exercise is a great opportunity to improve maritime interoperability and a unity factor for all South Pacific nations. French forces are involved from Numea so um, I give the floor to uh, Captain Bondil, which is from, this, uh, from our forces in Numea. Thank you. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, France uh, Pacific Nation, uh, to be sure of that, after a French admiral, you have now to listen to a French captain. So thank you, sir, to give me the opportunity to speak now on behalf of uh, Brigadier Valéry Putz, who is the French Armed Forces in New Caledonia, the FANC, is the commander of this force, and I am his deputy. But I am also the Maritime Zone Commander of New Caledonia, in charge of law enforcement at sea. In the FANC area, responsibility from Australia to Fiji, from PNG in the north to far south, the FANC commander is in charge of military matters, uh, what a military could call uh, OPCON, operational control. Amongst all other military relationships in the area of responsibility of the FANC commander, the relationship between the FANC and the Australian Defence Force is the richest and the deepest. Of course, political relationships between the two countries have known some difficulties, but from the military point of view, the bilateral relationship is underpinned by strong and enduring historical links. Australia and France work together in many fields, such as security and environment, and have shared interest in our region. Due to common interests and common challenges, operational cooperation between FANC 
and ADF is not optional. As the funk commander, Brigadier Valéry puts likes to say in his regular exchange with the ADF commanders, with the ADF commanders, it is a condition to produce a large part of desired military effect and also some political effects. An example of this cooperation from the end of April this year to the 7th of May 2022 was exercise Tagatatua, which took place in New Caledonia. This combined exercise, which is centered on land component, is tailored for the, particip for the participation of two allied nations, Australia, of course, and New Zealand. It will deepen cooperation and interoperability between the three forces. But the FONC main objective in the field of military cooperation remains the large-scale combined exercise, combined and joint exercise Croix du Sud, Southern uh, Cross, which is, scheduled, which is scheduled in April, May 2023. An enduring, well-known and appreciated exercise in the South Pacific, and uh, Admiral Ray has just mentioned it just before, Croix du Sud is ex expected to gather around 2,500 uh, people during this exercise, coming from at least uh, 15 countries. And it will be a major rendezvous for regional cooperation in the HADR field, as already mentioned. Meanwhile, as France is a permanent member of the PQUAD, the Pacific Quad, the FONC will, contri will contribute to tackling EUU fishing through unwavering support to cooperation. Uh, the operation like Kuru Kuru, Rebalong, Island Chief, and NAS, this operation will be conducted and monitored in July from the FONC HQ in Noumea. Exercise Kakadu will provide us a unique opportunity in the FONC uh, area of responsibility to strengthen our interoperability, not for the sake of it, but because it is mandatory to be prepared to act as a military forces at the highest level of intensity of engagement. Future challenges, at sea in particular, may require acting together with skill and readiness, sailing together, being totally interoperable, to be perfectly useful immediately and totally as a maritime forces will provide this capability. Of course, this applies also for land and air force component. The FONC are delighted to participate to Kakadu as we have already participated in so many previous Kakadu editions. So far, we intend to participate with a minimum a frigate and a maritime patrol aircraft for next Kakadu. Thank you for listening. Uh, thanks, Captain Bondo. Could I also just ask everyone to uh, thank Admiral Ray he in the middle of it, he didn't get a fourth his component. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, with great pleasure now that we uh, get to hear from an Indian colleague, uh, Captain uh, Sarabit uh, Palmer. He's well known in the um, international relations environment of the Indian Navy for his work that he's done through the Senior Fellow at the National Maritime Foundation. Uh, after an extensive uh, naval career that's included as, the, uh, as a... Uh, a pilot in command of seeking squadrons. He's recently been working as, the, uh, as a graduate of the National Defence Academy and a senior fellow with the National Maritime Foundation. Right now, his focus has been looking at maritime strategy and security uh, with a focus on lawfare style issues. I've had the pleasure of listening to him on a number of our forums, uh, and so I'm really looking forward to your contributions this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, warm words of introduction. So I'm, I'm still serving about a year to go, so. But it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you for the organizers. And could I have my presentation up, please? All right, what I plan to do is, uh, although India is a new entrant to Kakadu, what I plan to do is to take you through the paces how India looks at multilateral exercises. And within that, uh, there's a lot of commonality of why nations do multilateral exercises, what do they expect, and what are the takeaways, which is one of the questions that was posed to me. 
So uh, this I just showed, thought I'd show you a snapshot of the various bilateral and multilateral exercises institutionalized by India and various nations. This does not include the exercises that India takes part in, which are organized by other nations. So you can see that we got a full calendar ahead of us. So we start from January and it continues till Jan the next year, and then this session is repeated oft. Okay. Uh, so first question: Why do maritime forces exercise together? It's a question. If we ask, and I think if I give this answer, I won't be too off the mark. Is to shape a favorable and positive maritime environment. And that is something that we had a look at when we uh, revised our unclassified maritime uh, document, the Indian Maritime Security Strategy. And um, have I pressed the correct one? Sorry, next one. OK, here. So this is um, the document. It's available online. It makes interesting reading. I was party to it, so all faults are mine in any case. Um, Sorry. So basically, when we talked of a strategy for shaping a favorable and positive maritime environment, it was the third constituent strategy of the document. The first was deterrence, conflict. This was third and fourth was coastal and offshore security, followed by maritime force planning. But this is something that was not talked about earlier. So all we did was we put everything together, what India had been doing, and created a sort of a strategic communication. And Multilateral exercise of maritime engagements was an important aspect of this uh, strategy. So this is what I've said. And uh, it was essentially to promote security and stability at sea, enhance cooperation, mutual understanding, and interoperability with maritime forces of friendly nation. Now, these are words that everybody has been hearing since morning. So it's just to put that in perspective that we're not any different. And then, of course, engagement with maritime for, uh, is a number of ways and at multiple levels. In addition to all this, we also talked about naval deployments in our areas of interest. So if we are coming to, say, the South China Sea, we come to Australia to do a multilateral exercises. It's a way of a naval, de it's a naval deployment for us. And that is essential in our areas of interest. And also attached to that is when you start understanding what is the requirements, you also look back at developing uh, maritime capacity uh, building and capability enhancement through cooperation in training technical areas and hydrography was another one which we we've done a lot with many other nations so these are all familiar grounds to everybody because this is what everybody does in a nutshell and then of course cooperative efforts for development of regional mda now when we look at mda we realize that we are having exercises on mda also at various tabletop sharing of information through the fusion centers and we have our own which has been set up in Delhi. Uh, we have 11 ILOs and we hope the number will increase. And then of course is the conduct of maritime security operations both independently and in coordination with other maritime forces in the region. So this is would be an offshoot of the exercises we do and we have interoperability understandings and we get to talk to each other and we a feeling. And there's the morning, uh, there was uh, the statement made by Admiral Justin Jones, and he quoted another academic friend of mine, Graham, where he said, is the cult of the white uniform, is that oceans bind. If you have two maritime forces that meet, and when you speak to each other, there is a common language we all speak, which enables a better understanding, especially when you are addressing a crisis at sea. So I just thought I'll, I'll show you the snapshot. Now, this is... Uh, we, I made this map for the uh, strategy document. Essentially, it puts into perspective the area what we are looking at today, and more importantly, the 11 ident or what we identified as the choke points. The reason why I'm showing you this area is very clear, because one single nation cannot ensure a favorable and positive maritime environment. And that is the crux of why we go down the road of multilateral exercises so that we can be at the right place at the right time. I think HADR is the best example. There's a lot of talk of it during this conference, is that any time you have a ship at sea and there is a disaster, the ship can immediately be diverted. It does not matter what nationality or what nation it belongs to, but you provide the assistance required on time. And HADR, we all know the first 48 hours are the most critical. So what, what do we mean by favorable, favorable and positive? So we put our definition down in the document. So with favorable, we meant conditions of security and stability at sea, at sea 
with various threats being retained at low level. They already exist, there's nothing you can do much about them, but you just ensure that they remain at a low level. As far as positive is concerned, conditions wherein any rise in threats can be prevented or contained. That's what we meant by favorable and positive. When you put both together, then you look at uh, the essence of what we are doing today is that we would like to be called a preferred security partner and first responder in the maritime domain. Many years back, India was uh, termed as a uh, net security provider. It's a very difficult term to digest. So we're trying to walk away from that and said we'd rather be called a preferred security partner and a first maritime or a first responder in the maritime domain. So all nations who have the capacity and the <coughs> capability can actually fall into this uh, simple definition. That was a shift, but we retained that this was in line with India's approach to multilateralism. And if I borrow a page from our external affairs minister the other day, he said that perhaps we can also look at multi-alignment. Subtle change, but the same thing. But you align yourself with the thought process of the nations with which you are exercising so that you have a common focus of approach. So our principles, insofar as whether you call it net security provider or you call it preferred security, security, uh, preferred security partner, remain the same. And this is in line with India's outlook of Sagar, security and growth for all in the region, uh, which is also the theme of this conference in any case, in one way or the other. And then we also looked at neighborhood first and ACTI. So we looked at promotion of stability, maintenance of security and preservation of peace. Now if you put these pillars anywhere in any maritime domain, it will more or less be acceptable. So what, was, what do you mean by promotion of stability? So what we meant was promotion of good order at sea. Apart from ensuring stability at land, which is a political initiative and is going to be at the political level, this is something that navies and maritime forces can do, is promotion of good order at sea, adoption of measures to prevent and check the rise of threats from traditional and non-traditional sources. Traditional sources are a little difficult because then you get into the discussion role of alliances and the way you want to look at it. But non-traditional threats is something that all of us can work together. For maintenance of security was, uh, this remains the core element because the degree of security available ensures that you'll have a comprehensive and coordinated approach to contain challenges, counter threats and manage changes in the maritime environment. And if you remember the map which I showed you, the North Arabian Sea challenges are different from those in the Bay of Bengal, which are different from the Southwest Indian Ocean, which will be different from the waters north of Australia, South China Sea, or the waters of East Asia. So it's an important element that we look at the degree of security that's going to be available. And then, of course, uh, for maintenance of security, if there's a requirement, there will be a conduct of maritime security operations. India, in any case, conducts uh, coordinated patrols with its neighbors in the Bay of Bengal. That's something that can be replicated, perhaps. Preservation of peace, we meant keeping threats and challenges at minimal levels as much as possible. The reason was to facilitate economic growth and national development. So these were the three main pillars. And then, of course, the last one is adherence <coughs> to international laws and norms, something that is the bedrock of all engagements. So this requires a mutual understanding. So the best route is maritime engagements between maritime forces. And I say maritime forces because many of the nations in the Indo-Pacific itself don't have a separate Navy or a Coast Guard. Or they have just a maritime force. And then, of course, associated exercise of strategic communication that your intent, your purpose is very clear. Transparency is a hallmark that is required insofar as multilateral exercises go. So why actually do we exercise together? I'm getting back to that whole question. What is it that we can take away from uh, multilateral exercises? So one is, apart from shaping a favorable and positive maritime environment, you hone your operational skills. More days at sea, the more experience you have. And that's something that we've been taught, that the more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. In this case, if the war is non-traditional threats, then so be it. And then you imbibe best practices and procedures. We learn from each other. It enables your own doctrinal learnings. Is that do you need to revisit certain doctrines or some elements of your doctrine which you have put in place? 
And it's, of course, benign means for benchmarking capabilities in international environment. You, if you are playing against your own self, golfers will understand that. You benchmark yourself. You only improve. And then, of course, most importantly, you develop trust, mutual friendship, and respect. And that is something that we are witnessing today. We have so many nations in this uh, conference. So you'll find that engagements are an important part of most national and maritime strategies. You can call it engagements, multilateral exercise, the term changes. But that is a bedrock. And uh, I will leave you with this. Is, uh, I love this statement by Edward Lutwak, where he said that what is a navy in the absence of a strategy is, in effect, a priesthood. So if you do not engage these other and talk, you know where we stand. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will pivot from uh, the Indian Ocean now to deep into the Pacific. Uh, we have the uh, pleasure of having Commander Fox uh, speak to us. Commander Fox is currently the Commander of Fleet Operations of the Republic of Fiji Navy. He joined in 1999 and has uh, had the privilege of uh, serving in many operational environments and uh, learning both professional development and training in New Zealand, Australia, China and Malaysia. He's a specialist navigator who's completed the long navigation course with the Indian Navy. Uh, Commander Fox has also served the United Nations Assistance Mission in Iraq and as the Senior Liaison Officer for the United Nations Disengagement Observer Force in Syria. He's a graduate of Sesquiwal and the Indonesian Navy Staff College and he was appointed as the uh, Commander of Fleet Operations in 2021. Commander Fox. Uh, good afternoon, the Royal Australian Navy, our distinguished panelists, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, all you extraordinary listeners this year, afternoon. I'm honored to be part of this uh, Kakadu, this review of Kakadu in the last 30 years. I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional elders of the land, the past, present, and the emerging. Fiji first uh, participated in uh, Kakadu in 2016, sending three sea riders. We went up a step in 2018, where we sent in a patrol boat, sea riders, and HQ personnel. So the impressions of the benefits of Kakadu is uh, through the lessons of a nation that has just recently participated in the exercise. But let me assure you, new eyes sometimes generate amazing impressions. My presentation today on the experience of uh, participation in Kakadu is based on my answering of two questions. The first question is why does Fiji participate in Kakadu? Fiji believes that the future is uncertain and the region will be threatened by a variety of state and non-state adversaries, current and emerging. The advent of the of transboundary crises, like the recent COVID-19, is a prime example which had devastating impacts globally and regionally along with climate change, which exacerbates a lot of security threats. These uh, security challenges have negative effect on maritime security, which for small Pacific island countries is directly linked to human security. The prosperity of the Pacific people is based on the prosperity of our maritime resources. The security challenges are too large in scope and complex um, complexity for a single maritime force to address them effectively alone. Having an exercise like Kakadu builds foundation and capacity in working together to collectively address threats and ensure peace and prosperity in our beautiful part of the world. The lessons from the exercise learned have positive impact in our own operations at home as our maritime core skills are enhanced. This is, an, this is a, it's announced from the reports I've received to the presence of the Royal Australian Navy's sea training presence during the exercises. 
The second question I would like to answer is, what value does the Fiji Navy get out of the exercise? First is enhanced interoperability and familiarity. We become more aware of our partner maritime forces capability. The differences be brought about by our different languages, cultures and traditions and stereotypes are broken down because the exercises completely presses us to mingle. These are expectations for us to interact with each other. Second, contribution to preparation for collective responses to regional emergencies. Uh, there's an increase in emergencies in recent years in the Pacific region, the tropical cyclones in Fiji and Vanuatu, the volcano eruption in Tonga, the political unrest in the Solomons. And uh, for each of their emergencies, it is uh, noticeable that the regional countries are making collective responses. Kakadu provides the platform of preparation for these emergencies. Second is a, is a building of people-to-people -people relations. A very important part of the exercise are uh, the interactions, enhance knowledge, sharing of experience, and breaking down of both insensitivity and also sensitivity. For this, I build um, enhanced confidence in working together with our partner maritime forces. Hopefully, there are no duplication of tasks because uh, the other maritime forces have uh, confidence in us. Also, having uh, self confidence builds in self, and self esteem. Success is more achievable. As a small Navy, uh, participation in the exercise. Uh, allows, allows our personnel to learn and improves our skills. To conclude, the benefits of Kakadu to Fiji is immense. The lessons are valuable and skills enhanced contribute to our ability in ensuring prosperity for our people. Thank the Australian Navy for the opportunity for to be in participation in our participation in Kakadu. And hopefully we will be invited in the next Kadu. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Commander Fox, I pretty much gone out on a limb and guarantee you'll be invited to the next uh, Kakadu. Uh, I speak with a degree of confidence because uh, when I was uh, Director of Navy International Engagement, uh, we had the pleasure of formalising the Fiji Royal Australian Navy uh, relationship in 2020. Uh, so that I think that's a relationship that's just going from strength to strength. Uh, thanks very much for uh, all the uh, presenters this afternoon. We've got the opportunity to go into questions. As we wait for the first, I might throw to the chair for just a bit of a summary of uh, the quite, quite uh, broad range of discussions we went through this afternoon. Well, firstly, I, I wanted to thank all of our panellists because I think we've had some extraordinary range of um, input um, from the very high level, from our, our keynote, coming down to talk about some of the more sort of practical side of things. Um, and I'll just briefly pull out a couple of things that have, have come to me, both from this panel and building on, on, on the, the earlier ones. And one is, is trying to think about um, if we go from what Beck was saying and, and providing this very high level kind of framework and building also on what Justin Burke was saying earlier today about thinking about how exercises can be used uh, to provide a sort of a more clear strategic message and to link more directly into things like um, mini and multilateral type engagements um, and connect, I guess, more directly into to national diplomacy. Um, and there is an, an argument, and an argument that was put forward earlier about um, perhaps that needs, that needs to be done more, more directly and more closely. Um, and I think you can certainly see how, from, from what was, was said in the keynote, um, how these things sort of fit together. But one of the things that immediately came to me was, was the idea that actually some of what we've heard today perhaps points in a slightly different direction and that, that actually engagement between navies and, and the, the quote which has been come back around a couple of times is, is the, the white uniform cult of the sea. Um, and actually sometimes engagement at this level perhaps a step down from the, 
the more charged political environment at the higher level, um, perhaps that, that offers uh, a different type of opportunity for engagement and diplomacy. Um, and, and maybe uh, sort of giving these exercises greater strategic meaning is not necessarily purely a positive thing. Um, the other thing which I will throw out as, as something from an academic perspective that I'm really interested in is trying to dig a little bit more into these intangibles. Um, naval officers, whenever they talk about naval diplomacy, always talk about, oh, it's the relationships you build, it's the people you know. Um, and yes, this is great, um, but if I were a taxpayer, um, I would be interested in saying, okay, this is costing a lot of money, what are we actually getting for it? So there is, I've heard some great answers and responses to this in respect to RIMPAC and other things, but can we dig a little bit deeper in thinking about, well, what, what do those relationships actually get you? Um, where, how can we see a, a kind of a capability benefit from or something from those kind of relationships? Um, so those would be my kind of broad thoughts, um, and then hopefully we've, we've got some questions. Okay. Well, I think we might just uh, riff off a little bit of where you started to go there uh, and take advantage of uh, Admiral Madison's background as the chief as well as a diplomat um, and think about naval diplomacy. If you had your time again as the chief of Navy, how would you do things different? Um, so, so I go back up to the political level. And, and um, you know, if, if you asked me that question as a, as a ship's captain, I'd have a different answer. But as the chief of Navy, really, you're engaged at the political level. You're shaping policy. You're shaping advice. And, 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 and constantly um, coming up with new ways to argue for the strategic imperative around a globally deployable, combat-capable Navy, um, and and working to um, associate that globally deployable readiness with with strategic national interests, the, the way Australia, I think, does so well. And, and when you read, even the 2009 white paper, um, really was a maritime white paper which spoke about Australia like Canada, as a, um, a medium power, a, a, a maritime trading nation that needed to do what was required to sustain a, a, a free and open um, a global economy that floats on salt water. And, and, and through that free trade and, and that rules-based approach uh, to see economic prosperity, growth, and, and, and all that comes in terms of, of, of a social network. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, Admiral, but it's at the, at the Chief of Navy level, it is a constant influence campaign. Um, and um, this may sound a bit arrogant, but a, a sort of an educational campaign with your political masters and, 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 and also communicating w with the population, finding ways to get into universities, to get into uh, various opportunities to speak to different and, and disparate groups across the country. I remember going to, to, to meet with the Premier of Saskatchewan, which would be like going to, uh, you know, call on the Governor of, of, of Queensland, except that Saskatchewan is, has, has no salt water. And, and my first, my, my first um, statement to the Premier of Saskatchewan was, your province floats on salt water. And he looked at me like, uh, you know, what, 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 what do you mean by that? And I said, well, look, the hundreds of thousands of metric tons of lentils that are grown here in Saskatchewan, which are shipped by rail and, 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 and truck to, to, to ports in Vancouver and then shipped to Southeast and Southwest Asia, upon which the prosperity of your people actually depends, it, it, it floats on salt water. And so therefore you have a, you have a dog in this fight. You, you, you need to be advocating for a strong and capable Navy in this country. And he had never actually thought that way. And I've learned after the fact that the next thing he did was call the Prime Minister and say, hey, what are you doing about a stronger Navy in this country? So you know, it, it's, it's that kind of strategic level le leadership. Um, look, at, at the command level, um, I, I would look for every opportunity um, to break bread with, with fellow uh, commanding officers, to bring ships' companies together in, in, in any way you can, such as you have done during Kakadu. Um, 
You know, I, I remember during the, uh, uh, back in 2007, 2008, in the counter piracy mission off of the Somali coast, um, when the Chinese began to deploy their, uh, their task groups and to use the counter piracy mission as a way to develop a blue water expeditionary, you know, long tail logistics capability. Um, but our captains got alongside um, the, the Chinese frigates and, 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 you know, did light line transfers and, and, uh, and, 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 ex and went over and had a lunch and, and exchanged gifts and, you know, that, 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 that brotherhood or sisterhood yeah. of, of sailors, e e even when you know that strategically you are shaped as adversaries, there's this common understanding of what it means to, to, to generate a, a ship to, to, to a high degree of readiness and, and to go out and face the elements um, and to be constantly tired, sea state five, you know, 300 yard viz, trying to get your helicopter up and back um, and, and, and bringing your crew along with you. you all navies do this, yeah. all coast guards do this and there's a, a deep and profound respect and, it, and there are ways to actually leverage that tactical level trust to inform up and shape um, that strategic level of trust that we're all trying to, to, get. to get at. I, I, and I just think, yeah, we're reflecting on uh, Commander Fox's bio, the fact that he, you know, staff college in Indonesia, long navigation in India. So that deeper understanding and then that career influence that it flows through. And I think that's some of the subtle stuff. Um, we might go to take advantage of our keynote um, and relate a question relating to some of the strategic architectures. Um, Basically, I think the question is going to the trust that where do we find a sweet spot in the number of countries we have in an architecture or not? Too big, and then it becomes unwieldy, and which goes to your summer points. So particularly from the North and East Pacific um, and the Western Indian Ocean regions. That's a, a really interesting question. And when the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, concept uh, really started to take off, it was one that I was thinking about a lot. At what point, um, you know, where does the geography start and end in a way? What is the strategic neighbourhood? Because, of course, we know that Australia looks at uh, the boundaries of the Indo-Pacific for Australia are different um, from what they are for India, for example. Uh, and or even from Japan, the emphasis on who's in and who's out uh, is, is, is not necessarily shared. There's not, there's not an agreement on, on that particular question. And, you know, it was something that I, I've raised before with, with colleagues in, in a strategic environment. And I remember one person in DC um, saying to me, who cares? Like, does it matter that the, the, the four countries in the quad might not have a perfectly aligned picture of who's included within this Indo-Pacific region? And I guess I don't really have... A I don't really have a great answer for that, except for the fact that what kind of matters most is that the core uh, elements of, of the Indo-Pacific region are shared. So that there are some fundamental principles uh, that are shared by the kind of core countries that are advancing the specific Indo-Pacific security architecture that I was outlining uh, today, that, that is really uh, about... Um, trying to ensure an order that is based on rule of law, international rule of law, uh, that uh, can resist some of the revisionist uh, tendencies, particularly in this region of the People's Republic of China, um, trying to, uh, you know, um, deter against uh, unilateral use of force. Uh, these are the sorts of uh, issues that the core countries that are really promoting this vision of, of, of the Indo-Pacific, the free and open Indo-Pacific, although Australia doesn't talk so much in terms of that language, but that the key proponents are aligned on some of those core issues. Uh, and around that, there are disagreements, there are grey areas. Um, sometimes some states might be included uh, in Indo-Pacific, if they're from the kind of Indo-Pacific borderlands, they might be included in some things, they might not necessarily be included in other things. But I think that's part of the interesting point about security architectures, is that it's made up of institutions and patterns of relationships um, that are not necessarily inclusive of everyone all the time. 
And that's why we need to think about how they work together, how they knit together to try to create a cohesive and comprehensive, um, basically a patchwork quilt of, of, of institutions across uh, this region. Uh, and I think this is an ongoing process. You know, we think about Asia uh, or Asia Pacific. There was never necessarily one perception of what that region was or those regions were either. So they're a constant kind of work in progress. I think it does matter to, su to some extent, you know, it matters for where we might prioritise our resources, for example, as a middle power like Canada, where there does need to be a sense of we can't do everything, so where are we going to prioritise? And that might not be out into the Western Indian Ocean, for example, like it might be for India. Um, but nevertheless, what we're seeing, I think, is, um, is that patchwork of, of institutions across the Indian, Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia, Pacific Islands that don't necessarily canvas the whole region, but that can kind of knit together um, and, and work together um, sort of cooperatively. Well, that's what we should be aiming for anyway. <laughs> um, the next question uh, go to Captain Palmer um, related to your, your concept of multi-alignment and how it may be achieved. But I also just interested, I picked up when you talked about the importance of hydrography. You were the first person to mention it today, sort of, and I think the power of that from a training and capacity development, uh, particularly because we get signals from partners in, in the Pacific, you know, Fiji, for example, very interested in really developing and advancing some of the hydrographic capabilities. So just curious on your thoughts in that way. It's, uh, it's important to understand that when you engage with nations, you've got to first sit in that nation's place and see what is the maritime outlook. For example, the maritime outlook of an island nation would not be compatible or the same as, say, the maritime outlook of a uh, middle power, if I can just borrow that term from you, like Australia or India or Japan for that matter, if you look at it. So that's where the concept of multi-alignment comes in. So you've got to understand what is the requirement of the nation. If you throw too many big things at the smaller nations, they tend to get a little overawed. So you're not going to have the same response. So you've got to reach out to nations and understand what is the requirement and with that build the interoperability or the nature of the exercise you so want to develop. So for example, uh, hydrography for uh, India and the Indian Navy has been a big thing. I mean, it's not only have we uh, charted maps from, from uh, West Asia, Persian Gulf, down to even uh, the whole Western Indian Ocean, we're doing it today. We've also helped them establish their own training, how to develop maps. So you are developing a capability and a capacity in both ways, which sort of, it raises the confidence of those nations also. But it's important, as I said, to understand what is the maritime outlook of that particular nation. Especially when, you, when you're faced with the bigger nation, smaller nations tend to get overawed. This is, this is a big thing in the Indo-Pacific. You just cannot treat all nations the same way. You've got to identify it. So that was the multi-alignment part and the hydrography part because uh, we actually started out with hydrography when we started. And it's on, based on the request of various nations and that we went out and we did all that. That's something we need to look at. And with the numbers, if I may just uh, add on a few words on the number of nations, if you look at it. I'll give you the example. Kakadu has been discussed, so we know from where we came, where we have come. Uh, insofar as India is concerned, the Milan exercise, which we started with five nations. This year was 40. Can you handle all of them? Well, if you're going to have an organized conference, yes, obviously, yes, because you are preparing for it. But again, I, I would, uh, what you said, ma'am, is that I agree with you, is that finally when you are addressing a crisis at sea, it's only going to be those immediate nations who are affected, and those neighboring nations who have the requisite capacity and capability will come immediately to the fore. Anybody else with an enhanced capacity and capability would provide a back staff, would provide a backup or a support from afar. You have too many uh, nations in one go, it becomes a little bit of a hodgepodge. So at many times, even a large maritime space can become crowded. Mm -hmm. So that has to be kept in mind. Uh, I'd like to... Uh Take the next question to uh, France. I guess uh, Admiral Ray, it's a bit more of a uh, strategic uh, type question. The question uh, has got an interest in terms of uh, uh, carrier deployments and major capital asset deployments to the Pacific region in terms of where you might, might think of that happening um, and potential involvement in Kakadu's. Um, 
as, as I presented um, yesterday, the, the first step of our approach is to um, maintain our sovereignty. So um, we are um, permanently based in this part of the world, in our territories, um, assets uh, from all services, but we are speaking about naval assets uh, this afternoon, to, uh, to protect our population and our resources. And um, in the two main domains we, we mentioned together with Captain Bondil, HLDR and what I, we could call a Coast Guard function. Or, so with this, this asset, for, for, with a French approach, we uh, protect our uh, area and uh, population, ready to um, cooperate with all our partners because our strategy in this huge area is a, a partnership strategy, a cooperation strategy. So if um, I would like my friend join me to help me if necessary, I have to be ready to join my friend in his country to cooperate with me and to be ready. Uh, so. My first answer is to um, use our assets permanently based um, in the area uh, to uh, conduct this kind of operation. But it's, it's not enough to um, conduct um, all the strategy we have to, uh, to do. And uh, that's why we... Uh, send and we uh, realize some deployments from Europe where we, we have, if I could call, high-level assets. And what we did last year with uh, all the services um, uh, co coming from Europe to, uh, to the, the Indo-Pacific with uh, nuclear submarine, with amphibious task group, with uh, army troops, on board and with, uh, with aircraft, Rafale uh, fighters, tankers, and uh, airlift uh, assets to, to be able to uh, react at high level if it's necessary. So uh, we, we could imagine uh, a development of, of a Kakadu exercise from the, the present level to a high level and to be a react together if necessary. Uh, thank you for that, and I think uh, what uh, you managed to achieve with your submarine deployment uh, and be able to support it through Australia, sort of particularly during the COVID pandemic, was uh, quite quite remarkable. I just want to uh, thank uh, Captain Bondor for pointing out that we have a long and enduring relationship that uh, continues, um, and whether it be our shared land border in Antarctica uh, through to the maritime boundaries and all our other interests uh, through the Indo-Pacific. So. Uh, we do have a, a rich uh, history and common experience. Uh, I think, um, given the nature of time, uh, we'll uh, call an end to that uh, at session. Uh, we've got uh, session four starting in 20 minutes with a new panel. Again, it is certainly not um, going to be an afternoon session to miss. Uh, we've got the acting fleet commander already here in the wings for the keynote uh, address, but we'll also be joined uh, from uh, our colleagues from Brunei, New Zealand, Japan and the USA. So thank you very much.